Hey everybody, welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today we'll be watching Tecumseh and the Native American Resistance by Kings and Generals. Since the original video is an hour long, I'm going to be dividing this into two parts, so this will be part one of a two-part series, because honestly, each of my reactions will probably be about an hour long. So I'm doing this because we don't know too much U.S. history on this channel, but, you know, I know a bit about United States history, and I find it very interesting. Um, particularly this video, we're sort of highlighting indigenous history, Native American history, which I feel like is still kind of understudied, doesn't get the attention it deserves. So I'm excited to get into this topic. I don't know too much about Tecumseh in particular. Of course, I learned about him during high school, you know, high school American history. But my own research focuses on more revolutionary America, colonial America. So I think I can give some context while still learning a lot about Tecumseh and his cause. So, if you guys end up enjoying this video, I'd appreciate it if you would check out the Patreon or channel memberships for exclusive reaction content. Anyway, with all of that out of the way, let's jump right into this reaction. In the year 1812, a young mm. United States of America declared war on the British Empire and, and launched a full-scale invasion of Canada. No. Yes, and I don't want to get too much into this now because I figure we'll probably talk about it throughout this video. But the War of 1812, of course, occurred while the Napoleonic Wars were going on. Uh, that's what was happening in Europe. And over time, sort of a long list of grievances had developed between the young United States and the United Kingdom. Uh, one of the main examples was British impressment of American sailors, where they would go on to American merchant ships, seize American sailors, and force them to serve in the British Navy. There was a couple of these different things, and it basically amounted to the Americans feeling like Britain didn't truly respect or believe in their independence. Britain still saw them as a colony. And that's basically why this war happened. It ended up basically as a stalemate, a bit of a draw. Neither side really had uh, the advantage by the end. The Brits put up a surprisingly impressive resistance, now, you might be saying, well, why was it surprising? I mean, the British army was extremely impressive, extremely large. Well, because they kind of had their hands full with the Napoleonic Wars, right? And so that's why it ended as a bit of a stalemate. But one of the good things for the Americans that they got out of the war was that following this war, Britain fully recognized American independence and they would stop abusing their position of superiority over the United States. They stopped treating them like a colony. Um, so that's kind of a brief summary of the War of 1812, but I'm sure we'll get more into it throughout this video. No one expected the poorly defended British colony to hold out against a much larger American foe, and yet it did. Canada's salvation came arguably in the form of one man, mm. Tecumseh. Yes, and as they mention that and sort of frame it that way, it's always worth remembering. When we think about this era of American history, the American Revolution, the War of 1812, we often think about it as America versus Britain. Uh, and that's true, obviously, but you have to remember there's always Native Americans involved, oftentimes on both sides. Uh, in this instance, there were Natives on the American side, but more prominently, Tecumseh and his forces fought alongside the British, and they were an extremely important aspect of this conflict. Um, I think sometimes the natives are forgotten about in this whole simplified story of America versus Britain. And that's why a video like this is good, because we're, you know, remembering the events that really happened and who was actually involved. He was fighting for his people, the indigenous tribes of North America. His alliance with the British was out of convenience alone, mm -hmm. and his true goal was simple to create a united native nation across the American frontier and retake the land that had been lost. Yeah, it's not like Tecumseh had some special affinity for the British imperial mission. It's just at that time, he felt like siding with the British would give him a better chance to create an independent nation for his people than siding with the Americans would. Welcome to our video on the life of Tecumseh. 
Shout out to the Ridge Wallet for sponsoring this video. Members of our... All right, you guys know the deal. Um, I want you to go to Kings and Generals channel. The link to their video is in the description. Leave them a like, subscribe to their channel. Go and check out their sponsor. Their link is on the screen right now. Basically, show them support for making these fantastic videos. To tell Tecumseh's story from the very beginning, we must explain the world he was born into. Native tribes had inhabited North America for over 12,000 years, but diseases brought upon them by Europeans had apocalyptic effects on their society. Yeah. By the time the first English pilgrims arrived at Plymouth Rock in 1620, a smallpox epidemic had killed 90% of the local population. And it's interesting to think, you know, we think about the European settlers arriving and with their superior weaponry and technology beating the natives, but if 90% of your population is gone, you sort of wonder, well, what would have happened if the disease wasn't part of it <laughs> and 100% of the native population was still there? Uh, I think they would have had a much better chance of resisting European colonization. I mean, if you look at the early years of European uh, settlement, particularly on the east coast of North America, British settlers, they had a really hard time staying alive, and they had several destructive wars with the natives that, you know, didn't go so well for the settlers. So, you know, if they had 100% of their population, the indigenous peoples... How would things have gone? I'm not sure. By the 18th century, the eastern seaboard was dominated by Britain's 13 colonies, with tribes like the Pequot, Powhatan and Massachusetts all but wiped out and pushed mm -hmm. out of their homes. Now peoples like the Odawas, Shawnees, Lenape and the powerful Iroquois Confederacy were on the border of this expansion. Mm. Further inland, the French Empire claimed a vast swath of territory from Labrador to Louisiana. It was a sparsely populated land where native tribes exercised full autonomy and were more or less equal partners in the incredibly lucrative fur trade. Yeah, the relationships that Native Americans had with Europeans differed on the circumstances. So in French territory, like they said, it was far less populated. It was very sparsely settled by French settlers. Uh, it was more used for stuff like fur trading. And so it was better for the French to maintain friendly and more equal relationships with the indigenous peoples than it was for the British settlers who had settled a lot of the East Coast uh, pretty heavily at this point. They had their own communities. They weren't interested in integrating na the Native Americans. They wanted their own space. And so they had a far more violent and conflict-ridden relationship with the local indigenous peoples. The French tended not to impose on native territory, and their presence provided a buffer against British expansion. This all changed. Yeah, I mean, look, obviously, <laughs> many of the indigenous people would have preferred if the French weren't there at all. But once the French, once the French were pushed out, um... A lot of them would say, you know, damn, <laughs> I wish uh, the French had control instead of the Brits because, and then the United States, because obviously, as we know, it just keeps getting worse and worse for the Native Americans in this area. Changed in 1754, as when the Seven Years' War erupted in North America, England and France found themselves in a war for dominance over the New World, mm -hmm. and the natives. Yeah, a war for dominance over the New World or mainly a war for dominance over the Ohio River Valley. Uh, you never thought Ohio could be so important, but as you can see on this map, it is right in the middle. It is the main territory that the Brits and the French are fighting over. The Seven Years' War, this was actually a global war. The main theater was in Europe, but there was battling throughout the world, prominently in North America, and the North American theater of the war is often referred to as the French and Indian War were forced to pick sides. The six nations of the Iroquois declared for England, but nearly all the other local tribes fought alongside the French. Mm -hmm. The French were ultimately defeated and their territory annexed. Mm -hmm. The British now ventured inland, occupying formerly French forts along the Great Lakes and Ohio. It was well known. One of the important forts in this conflict was Fort Duquesne, 
um, which would be anglicized under the name Fort Pitt in the city of Pittsburgh. How about that? ...that unlike the French, the British did not come to trade furs, but to flatten and tame the land and displace yeah. the natives who hunted and gathered there. As settlers began to trickle westwards and British soldiers treated the locals with contempt, whispers of war began to spread amongst the tribes of the Old Northwest. And this is the point I made. Look, it's not like the natives wanted the French there either. But once the French were gone, and you can see that most of the tribes sided with the French, the British colonization was even worse. Um, whereas the French colonization wasn't really too bad in a lot of cases. I don't want to generalize. There were brutalities committed by the French as well. But primarily the relationship was a trade relationship. And when the Brits arrived, when they took over the territory, they wanted to do things their way. In 1763, the Odawa chieftain Pontiac created an alliance of 14 tribes mm. and proceeded to wage a bloody and vengeful war upon the British. Yep. His native confederacy raised hell, capturing eight forts along the Great Lakes, killing over 2,000 settlers and 400 soldiers. Pontiac's fierce resistance forced the British to pull back and mm -hmm. reaffirm an earlier treaty in which the 13 colonies promised not to settle land west of the Allegheny Mountains. Yeah, so, I mean, look at that. Native resistance was effective. Like I said, there's some idea that the Europeans arrived with their superior weapons and technology and just steamrolled the natives from the Atlantic to the, to the Pacific. Not true. There was significant resistance uh, at several points throughout this uh, early American history, particularly in the 1600s. Uh, like I said, there were a lot of destructive wars between the indigenous people and the settlers, or Pontiac's War. Um, now look, of course, if the British had sent all their resources, they could have defeated the indigenous people, but it just wasn't worth it. And so after this piece of resistance, the Brits said, okay, fine, you can have your land, and our colonists won't settle west of what was called the Proclamation Line of 1763, basically a line along the Allegheny Mountains, and the British government said, none of our settlers will settle west of that line, that'll be your land. Now, the issue was that the British, the British settlers, who were getting increasingly annoyed and frustrated with the rule of the British government, just ignored that <laughs> and continued to move west of this line. Uh, and this was actually one of the things that would lead to the American Revolution, was this disagreement over where you could settle between, you know, the colonists who are actually in the colonies, who we might call in a couple years Americans, and the British government, who didn't want any more conflict with the natives. Peace was made in 1766, and the tide of expansion had been stemmed for now, but war would soon come to native peoples once more. Two years later, the man fated to lead them into battle entered the world. In March of 1768, Tecumseh was born to the Shawnee people in a village along the Ohio River. It is said that upon giving birth, his mother looked to the heavens and saw a comet blazing across the night sky. This is where the child got his name, Tecumseh, the shooting star. Huh, I didn't know that, how about that? The Shawnee had long been a wandering people, beset by conflicts with other tribes. In centuries past, the Iroquois had pushed them eastward from their old territory. They had settled in many places before coming to their present spot along the Ohio River, but mm. turmoil and warfare would carry over into Tecumseh's childhood. In the same year he was born, the Iroquois sold land in Kentucky and West Virginia to the British. These were plains the Shawnee depended on for hunting, but when they voiced their protests, they were ignored both by the British and the Iroquois. Hmm. So, when continental settlers began pouring westward into their newly purchased territory, Shawnee warriors prepared to defend their lands. Hmm. In 1774, a six-year-old... I mean, as you can see, by the way, of course there was politicking going on between the Europeans and the natives, but keep in mind, <laughs> it's not like the native tribes were always unified. In fact, a lot of the time, they were very divided. And so there were agreements, politicking, and disagreements going on between the native tribes themselves. 
Tecumseh watched his father, Pukishinwao, and his eldest brother, Chizikau, partake in a ritual war dance before heading away to battle. They met their foe at Point Pleasant, a force of Virginia militiamen, who the natives called the Big Knives on account of the sabers worn by the colonial officers. Hmm. Outnumbered and outgunned, the native warriors were driven back. As a result, the Shawnee were forced to relinquish their hunting ground. Oh yeah, and as you can see in this picture, by the way, a lot of the Native Americans were armed with firearms. <laughs> you know, they weren't using... A lot of them weren't using bows and arrows at this point. Now, I feel like that's a bit of a misconception. Early on, of course, they were primarily using bows and arrows. Though, if we look at some of the earlier conflict between colonists and native uh, natives, if we're looking at sort of heavily wooded or swampy areas... And we have Europeans heavily armored with their slow-firing muskets, and natives who can move a lot faster with their bows and arrows. At certain points, using a bow and arrow was actually more effective than a firearm. But, of course, we're out in the open plains at this point, right? And a lot of the natives are using firearms that they've got from the Europeans. They've traded the Europeans, you know, goods for their firearms. And so, you know, this is not... Uh, necessarily the stereotypical image of Native Americans using bows and arrows fighting against the armed colonists that I think a lot of people would imagine. Uh, it's definitely on a more even playing field than that. Allowing the settlers to move westward with impunity. Tecumseh's father was mortally wounded in the battle. With his dying breath, he beseeched his firstborn son to preserve the dignity of his family line and one day lead his younger brothers into battle. The news of Pukashinwao's death devastated Tecumseh's mother, who mm. was pregnant with the last of his children. It was no less hard upon the boy himself. Fatherless at six years old, his family was uprooted and forced to move west. That winter, his mother gave birth to triplets. Of the two that survived, one was named Lalawethika. Initially a useless layabout, the sickly <laughs> boy would later have a profound impact on Tecumseh's life. Okay. A year later, the 13 colonies declared their independence from the British Empire, plunging mm. the region into war and imposing a new threat upon native peoples. Yep. As the revel And if you view this from the native perspective, like I was saying earlier, a lot of times we just see this um, as America versus Britain. We see it, I mean, I'm an American, we see it from the American perspective, or some of you might see it from the European perspective. But think about the native perspective. Uh, this means more warfare for them, another colonial power. Um, I mean, it was, I think, pretty immediately clear that you, the United States was a colonial power, or it would become clear very soon, uh, and they absolutely were, of course. Uh, another colonial power on the continent that they had to worry about. They had to decide how to deal with the U.S., who would they side with, who would they make deals with. Um, you know, so another complication that the Native Americans had to handle, and down the line, this would mean more warfare. Revolutionary war raged between patriot and loyalist. Many native bands now joined the fray on the side of the British crown. Among them were the Shawnee, who sought to reclaim the land lost to the now rebellious frontiersmen. Yeah, and of course the consideration is, one, um, maybe it's better to side with the devil you do know instead of the devil you don't know. So, at least they're familiar with British rule. They don't quite know what the colonists are going to do yet. And two, we talked about the proclamation line of 1763. It was the British government who, after facing resistance from the Native Americans, said, okay, fine, you can have your territory and we won't settle it. Versus the American settlers who are now fighting for the independence of the United States, they were the ones who kept trying to settle westward and take land from the natives. So from their perspective, the Brits are probably the better choice to side with. Though, like I said, there were some tribes who sided with the Americans. It's a complicated picture. This invoked the ire of the Americans, who responded wrathfully, sending soldiers into Shawnee lands. Before long, a large band of Kentucky militia were advancing upon Tecumseh's village. Mm. Still too young to fight, Tecumseh had fled alongside the women and children to nearby bluffs, while the warriors of the village tried to hold off the militia to no avail. 
It was not the first time Tecumseh was forced to move, but this time he was there to see his village burn, witnessing with his own eyes the destruction caused by the big knives. Never again would Tecumseh sit idly by while his people's land was ravaged. I mean, it's pretty <laughs> clear why he ended up the way he ended up, <laughs> with how his childhood was, his father dying, witnessing his village burning, right? I mean, it's pretty obvious why he went in the direction he did, and you can't really blame the kid after experiencing all he experienced at the hand of these American colonists. In the years that followed, Tecumseh began training to become the warrior his father had wanted him to be. His eldest brother, Chisikau, took full responsibility for his younger brother's growth, obeying his dying father's last wish. Tecumseh was taught how to hunt, how to fight, and how to live as a Shawnee warrior should. Mm. When he entered adolescence, Chisikau blackened Tecumseh's face and sent him alone into the woods to find his guardian spirit. Tecumseh fasted and meditated, and his spirit came to him in a vision. He never revealed to anyone what form his ethereal guardian took. Wow. Tecumseh soon matured into a- That's fascinating. Never revealed to anybody. So, you know, not only do the history books not know, but nobody knew. That was something he kept entirely to himself. Um, I'm sure that must have been a great source of inner strength, right? That religious experience, and then having this thing that you keep to yourself, but you can draw on. That's fascinating. A strong, intelligent young man. Allegedly, he once slew 16 bison with only a bow and a single quiver of arrows. He also <laughs> drew no small amount of attention from the opposite sex. <laughs> the women of the Shawnee were very fond of Tecumseh, Hello. but he did not indulge in their attention, often brushing off their advances. Tecumseh's first taste of Damn, he was a sigma. <laughs> battle came in 1786. The young warrior confronted a host of big knives alongside Chisikau and a host of Shawnee warriors at Mad River, Ohio. When the Americans fired a musket volley across the river, Tecumseh's nerve broke and he panicked mm. and ran. He had failed his first test as a- Damn. It's also worth noting 1786, not particularly well-known year amongst Americans, there is like constant conflict going on between uh, Americans out west and the indigenous people of the region, but for you know Americans in our history books, we don't go into a great detail over that, or at least you know I didn't in my history class. We just, I mean, we mentioned yeah, there's constant conflict going on, but it's like it's at the periphery, it's at the edge. There are far more important things going on back out east versus, of course, for the native peoples of this region. This is the most important thing to them. I mean, this is their their life, their homes, their culture. This is everything. So you can sort of see the difference in perspectives. The warrior. He was disgusted with himself and vowed to never show cowardice again. Okay. The following years saw Tecumseh come into his own as a capable warrior, albeit still in the shadow of his eldest brother. Continued conflict with the United States seemed inevitable. The young nation was burgeoning and hungry for expansion. Many tribes were resolved to do whatever was necessary to stop colonial encroachment onto their land. In 1785, this tension evolved into a prolonged frontier conflict known mm. to the Americans as the Northwest Indian War. Rarely able to take on the US Army head on, many native warbands resorted to hit and run tactics. By 1788, Tecumseh and Chisikau were involved in more than their fair share of skirmishes. Hmm. Initially camped on the Ohio River, the two brothers and their band of warriors habitually raided the flatboat that traversed the busy thoroughfare. These boats carried food, provisions and settlers, and their waylaying discouraged many from entering native land. Oh yeah. If you were an American settler heading out west, I mean, this had basically always been true, you had to be ready to actively defend yourself and fight back against the natives because <laughs> obviously the native people were not happy that these colonists were there and they were going to fight back. So there was an incredible level of violence between these two sides 
Uh, and oftentimes, the American colonists were pretty upset with the American government that it wasn't providing more help. I mean, this is one of the issues they had with the British government. The Brits didn't want them to settle out west. And this is one of the things that led to the American Revolution. You know, fast forward, now we have the independent United States, but still, the American government can't afford to send too many resources out west to support these American settlers, at least not at this point. And so a lot of these settlers are pretty damn frustrated with the government over their lack of aid. And this is just part of that sort of rural west versus urban east divide that already existed and continued to develop in the US. During this turbulent period of his life, Tecumseh began to see the world in a new way. He was fighting alongside not just the Shawnee, but also Cherokees, Mingos yep. and Delawares. He began to see himself as a native first and a Shawnee second, mm. and realized that his people would never be free of the yoke of colonialism unless they banded together as one. And this is a very interesting change in perspective and identity because, you know, native tribes had always identified, or native people had always identified with their tribe first. But under the pressure of colonization and warfare with the Americans, they sort of started to unify. And the idea of being a native first and foremost, even over your tribal identity, began to develop and become far more widespread. And Tecumseh was definitely an important figure in that change. He began to detest the idea that any one tribe could sell land to the whites, whatever the consequences it brought upon other tribes. Tecumseh came to the revelation that land belonged to no one band, but to all native peoples. Mm. Thus, he began to dream of a united and independent nation held together by a shared indigenous identity. And I mean, this is more of a sort of European style nationalism or the idea, he's literally talking about the idea of a nation state. Um, but like I said, it's not like the natives independently arrived at this free from conflict. This idea has developed due to the pressure that they're under from these European empires. You know, this is part of survival. Tecumseh probably feels like the native tribes cannot survive being independent from each other, and he's right, they can't. And so what he wants to do is to basically form a Native American nation state, like the Europeans do. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's a really interesting, like I said, interesting change in perspective and identity. In 1791, <clears throat> an alliance of tribes formed to push the Americans back east of the Ohio River. Led by the Little Turtle of the Miami and Blue Jacket of the Shawnee, they fell upon a force of 1,000 US soldiers camped at the Wabash River and massacred them. It is to this day the single greatest victory won alone by native peoples Damn. against the Americans. Wow. Tecumseh was not at the battle at the Wabash, but certainly took part in the increased back and forth raiding that followed in its wake. Mm. In September of 1792, Tecumseh and Chisikau joined a war party of Cherokees and Creeks and launched an assault upon Buchanan Station in Tennessee. From inside a stockaded blockhouse, 20 frontiersmen were able to hold off 300 native warriors. In this fateful battle, Chisikau was slain, shot dead by an American soldier through a porthole, while Tecumseh managed to retreat with his life. Yeah, I mean, this is a brutal, violent life. Like I said, this is a brutal, violent life for the American settlers out west, and for the native peoples of the region. Tecumseh has lost his brother, his father, I'm sure other family members and friends. Um, you know, he's lost his village. He keeps losing to this conflict, and I'm sure that only makes him more radical, more willing to go out there and fight because of everything he's lost at this point. The loss of his older brother fell hard upon the young Shawnee, but Chisikau had accomplished what his dying father had beseeched he do all those years ago. Among many native groups, leadership was not determined through formal appointment, but by mm. earning the respect of one's peers. In the years that followed Chisikau's death, Tecumseh had become a fighter of great renown and began to accumulate a small warband loyal to him. By 1794, 
the Northwest Indian War was nearing its climax. Tecumseh and his warriors joined forces with the Confederacy led by Little Turtle and Blue Jacket, forming a combined army of 1,300 men. Hmm. Fighting alongside them was a British-led contingent of Canadian militias who had a vested interest in undermining American influence in the region. <laughs> yeah. Together, they faced an army of 2,000 American soldiers on the bank of the Maumee River. In what would later be known as the Battle of Fallen Timbers, the natives were overwhelmed by American gunfire and attempted to retreat behind the walls of the British-held Fort Miami. And, by the way, this is one of those grievances I talked about earlier that would develop between the Americans and the Brits. You know, the Americans felt like they had the right to continue expanding westward. I mean, sea to shining sea, right? Atlantic to Pacific. The Americans wanted to take as much land as possible, and they felt like it was their, their right. And so they were incredibly frustrated that the British kept fighting them either directly or what was more annoying them was that the British were sending contingents of troops to fight alongside the natives or sending weapons and supplies to the natives. Um, so yeah, this was one of those grievances that America brought to the table in the War of 1812. The British would not let them in, not willing to risk all-out war with the US. Facing a massacre, the natives were forced to scatter. The and that's a good example of the British attitude. They didn't want a full-scale war with the United States. You know, they were not interested. They didn't want to devote the resources to that. And so, like I said, they were giving supplies and weapons to the natives, sending British contingents with the natives to fight. But if it ever got too much, they would pull back. <laughs> and they'd say, oh, we don't want a war with the Americans. We're just, you know, supporting uh, the independent indigenous cause. Of course, the British didn't care about the natives. Um, in any sort of genuine way, they just liked that the indigenous peoples were there to prevent American expansion. So as you can see, this is sort of a complex political situation where the Americans and the Brits are sort of fighting through the natives against each other. But also, the natives are <laughs> and also an independent party in this whole thing, so complicated. The betrayal Tecumseh suffered at the hands of the British was one he would not forget. Mm -hmm. The engagement at the Fallen Timbers ended the 10-year frontier war, and the United States finally managed to impose their sovereignty over the Old Northwest. Native leaders were compelled to sign the Treaty of Greenville, a document that forced them to recognize large chunks of Ohio and the Great Lakes as American mm. soil. Yep. Tecumseh was disgusted by this capitulation and stubbornly refused to sign the treaty. Instead, he retreated with his followers to Buck Creek, where he founded a village. For the next 10 years, Tecumseh bided his time, waiting for the opportunity in which he could make his dream a reality, a dream of a united, self-sufficient native nation. That opportunity would arrive in 1805, when Tecumseh's Whoa. laggard of a younger brother received a vision from the Great Spirit. The idler, known as Lalawathika, would transform into Tenskwetawe, the Great Prophet. Yeah, and I do remember learning about this in high school, how, you know, Tecumseh was the military leader and his brother, the Prophet, was a religious leader. Though I don't remember too many specifics, but that's, I mean, that's an interesting and probably effective brother combo. You know, one brother leads the military, the other brother leads spiritually. And lead a religious revival that would bring together tribes from all corners of the American frontier. By the turn of the 19th century, it was clear that the Americans' hunger for territory had not been sated. <laughs> Yep. The Louisiana Purchase, which saw a massive stretch of land sold by the French to the United States, all but confirmed that further ingress into native inhabited lands was inevitable. Yeah, you know, Napoleon didn't have much to do in North America. He was busy dealing with Haiti, and by the way, struggling to deal with Haiti. It wasn't going his way. He had other concerns. He was building his European empire. And so the U.S. purchased... Uh, you know, Louisiana, or all the French territory um, that we just saw on that map for an extremely low price. I mean, they got an incredible deal in all that territory, 
And it really continued the American idea of sort of manifest destiny, right? Uh, the United States, the people of the United States, had a God-given right to continue expanding westwards. This only enforced and encouraged that, um, you know, now that they control the Mississippi, which was an extremely important network of trade, communication. Um, so yeah, the U.S. continued expanding. In the aftermath of their victory in the Northwest Indian War, over 600,000 American pioneers would settle in the newly established states of Kentucky and Ohio, as well as the Territory of Indiana. It's also funny, by the way, that uh, these were called the Northwest Territories. <laughs> Indiana, Ohio. <laughs> that is what was Northwest back in the day. Um, reminds you how small the United States was at one point. Uh, today, of course, the Northwest is like Washington and Oregon, which is way far west of uh, this area. <laughs> Land once dominated by native tribes. Disunited and outnumbered, the natives of the frontier were direly outmatched. Yep. Despite this, Tecumseh never gave up his grand ambitions to retake native territories. As fate would have it, it would actually be his brother who would spark the movement that would snowball into the creation of his great confederacy. And you can see why Tecumseh's ideas keep getting reinforced. He wants to form this unified nation, and the native tribes can never really manage to unify, and they keep losing. But it's not like they're being completely destroyed. They're putting up impressive resistance, so to Tecumseh, you know, what this is saying is if we can just unify, if we can just come together, then we have a good chance of defeating the Americans and establishing our own country. So you can really understand why he felt that way. This man was Lalawethika, meaning he who makes a loud noise. He huh. had always been the black sheep of the family, having never become a great warrior like his brothers. A freak accident had taken out his eye when he was young, and he mm. spent the majority of his youth as a perpetually drunk good-for-nothing. <laughs> In the year 1805, everything changed. One day, Lalawethika was smoking in his wigwam when suddenly his body seized up and he fell into a trance. His stupor was so deep that those around him thought he had died, yet soon he awoke as a changed man. Lalawethika told everyone that he had received a vision from the Great Spirit, in which he had seen his people led onto a path of doom, and was now convinced that the Great Spirit had sent him on a mission to purify native culture for their salvation. He took on a What a remarkable <laughs> transformation. Uh, a layabout, you know, a good-for-nothing. He's just hanging around, smoking in his tent, and then all of a sudden, something happens. Uh, he has some sort of epiphany, and... Now he is a religious prophet who will become extremely important uh, in the history of this region and his people. Pretty remarkable. New name, Tenskwatua, the open door. In time, he became known to his people as the prophet. The prophet soon began spreading his teachings amongst the Shawnee. He preached that his people were the great spirit's original creations. In contrast, the white people were children of the evil spirit that grew mm. from the scum of the great waters. And it's funny because it sort of mirrors uh, the opposite, I guess, of what the European, now American settlers thought of themselves. You know, they thought they were God's chosen people and, you know, God wanted them to expand westwards and expand the American nation. So it's just, uh, and that's what the European colonists thought when they arrived. You know, they were God's chosen people and the natives were irreligious, unchristian heathens. So it's fascinating how, um, you know, they both, so, both sort of come to the same conclusion. You know, God has chosen us, and those other people, you know, God doesn't like, or they're the spawn of Satan or some other evil. Um, though, you know, if you're the native people, <laughs> yeah, I can understand why you would think that uh, the American slash European colonists were the spawn of some sort of evil considering all that you've gone through up until this point. As such, natives bore an innate responsibility to keep their way of life pure of colonial influence. To this endeavor, he denounced intermarriage between natives and whites, which mm -hmm. had become commonplace in the last few decades. He spoke out against alcoholism 
and forbade the evils of drink. Yep. He renounced European clothing and other such innovations brought to his land since first contact, mandating his followers wear the traditional garments of their people. And this idea wouldn't stop with the Prophet. Uh, it would continue past him. And it's uh, it's an interesting idea, and it shows you, by the way, how much the natives had been influenced by the Europeans. You know, I talked about earlier, there's this stereotypical view of, uh, even at this point in history, the natives with their bows and arrows fighting back against the technologically advanced Europeans. But from this, we can see that the indigenous peoples have adopted a lot of the stuff the Europeans have brought with them, for better and for worse. I mean, alcohol, that's a good example. Uh, even today, Native American communities have a really high rate of alcoholism because, um, you know, it, they weren't accustomed to it, I guess. They weren't used to it. It was brought by the Europeans, and it became a real problem. So that's an example of something brought by the Europeans. Like a lot of things brought by the Europeans, disease... Um, that was really bad for indigenous communities and has plagued them up until this day. In the winter of 1805, a familiar calamity struck the Old Northwest. Native communities were once more afflicted by an outbreak of smallpox, leaving many communities crippled or entirely depopulated. Mm. Disease had sadly become old news to the natives by this point. And, you know... Of course, smallpox still affected Europeans, though at this point there were uh, inoculation efforts. Inoculation efforts against smallpox had begun in the 1700s. But uh, even though smallpox still affected European communities, of course their immune systems were far more attuned to it than Native Americans who had existed for thousands and thousands of years without having to deal with it. So I would imagine that a smallpox outbreak would be far more devastating for native peoples than it would for Europeans. Who often coped by blaming their misfortune on witches, who supposedly were sinister herbalists capable of brewing malicious potions and spreading illness. Hmm. Thus, in the spring of 1806, the prophet became a major ringleader in a witch hunt that spread across the old northwest. A hunt well, there's another thing that's pretty <laughs> familiar to the uh, the European settlers' witch hunts. Uh, that's a real classic. And he used to further spread the influence of his religious movement. Tenskwatawa hounded down all those who denounced him and all who embraced the ways of the white man. Mm. Un and that's worth noting as well. We talked about how it's clear that the native communities had been influenced by the Europeans. Uh, and you have people like Ten Tenskwatawa... Uh, the prophet, that's easier for me to pronounce, sorry, <laughs> um, who fought back against that. They wanted to purge their communities of European influence. But there were also some people who wanted to go the opposite direction. They felt the best chance for native survival was to adapt, assimilate into European society. Of course, a lot of other uh, indigenous peoples felt like that was no survival at all. That was destroying and losing their culture, their identity as a people. But there were some uh, native people who felt like uh, assimilating into white society was the best way to go about it. Of course, they did not have an easy time because even if they adopted the European's way of doing things, European dress, customs, there was still immense discrimination just because they were native. So it was, uh, I mean, a difficult position to be in. Under his watch, Christian natives and chieftains friendly to the Americans were captured, tortured, and killed, all in the name of rooting allegedly evil witches out of native communities. Mm. The prophet soon had a growing following, not just among the Shawnee, but many neighboring tribes as well. The growing unrest in the native Northwest began to make American settlers on the frontier uneasy. <laughs> One such man was William Henry Harrison. Uh, he's going to be a very important player in the story of Tecumseh. Um, in fact, he's kind of going to make a name for himself, as we will see throughout this video. So, hey, keep an eye on William Henry Harrison. Governor of the Indiana Territory. He had fought in the Northwest Indian Wars a decade earlier, and a religious uprising centered around resisting colonialism was a threat to the settlers in his jurisdiction. Seeking to pacify the movement, 
Harrison denounced Tenskwatawa to the Delawares with conviction, saying, Who is this pretended prophet who dares to speak in the name of the great creator? Is he more wise or virtuous than you are yourselves that he should convey to you the orders of your god? To affirm his spiritual powers, the prophet told his followers of a day of black sun. He was correct. By accurately predicting a solar eclipse, Tenskwatawa had proven his power in the eyes of his followers. Hmm. In 1808, the Prophet joined forces with Tecumseh. Together, the two brothers founded a village upon the confluence of the Wabash and Tippecanoe rivers. The old chieftain, Little Turtle, who had fought at Fallen Timbers, warned Tecumseh that he was settling on the lands of the Miami, to which Tecumseh replied devoutly that he was settling on native lands. And there we go. We can see the divide between Tecumseh and other natives, or I guess you could also frame it as sort of the old way of thinking and the new way of thinking. Little Turtle is thinking traditionally, as native peoples have always seen themselves. He's thinking about it through the lens of tribal society. Everyone belongs to a tribe, and that is who they're loyal to. That's where their allegiance lies. Tecumseh, on the other hand, is viewing it in this new way, that I'd say is more similar to how the Europeans did nationalism, uh, the idea of a nation-state. He's saying it's not about different tribes. It's about us as a people. We have this native nation, and so it doesn't matter if the, it's a, you know, the Miami or the Shawnee or whomever, you know, we're all one people. Um, so, you know, very interesting difference there. The brothers' village came to be known as Prophetstown, and would serve as the right. staging point for their pan-native resistance movement. In the following years, people from all over the Old Northwest filtered into Prophetstown, drawn to Tenskwatawa's teachings and Tecumseh's reputation as a warrior. Mm. The community grew quickly from a small village into a bustling multi-tribal township, a hub of Native American cultural and political activity. Huh. In the end, it was Tecumseh who assumed the ultimate chieftaincy of their budding community. Tecumseh soon set out from Prophetstown on a mission to convince the tribes of the Old Northwest that resistance, not assimilation, was the key to their survival. And as we can see, it's not like everybody instantly fell in line and said, you know what, Tecumseh, you're exactly right. Some tribes felt that assimilation was the better way to go. And of course, there's sort of a spectrum. You know, there were some Native Americans who went completely assimilation. I mean, they completely assimilated into European society. There were some, like Tecumseh and his brother, who wanted to completely purge European influence. And then, of course, there's a spectrum between those two options. There's varying degrees of assimilation. Uh, most Native people and, you know, the Native tribes wanted to maintain some degree of independence, ideally full independence, independence, but that wasn't really possible. And so they felt to do that, having some degree of assimilation or alliance with uh, the Europeans or the Americans would allow them to maintain some autonomy. Uh, Tecumseh is saying, you know, no, we need to get rid of all of that. We need complete independence and self-reliance. We don't want any assimilation with uh, the European and American settlers. And to build a confederacy that stretched across the American frontier. The chieftain traveled from village to village, dazzling people with his charismatic orations and legendary strength. I was going to say, he must... I mean, we've already seen a lot of his story, but he clearly must have been a really charismatic guy. He must have been a great speaker, able to connect with people, because, I mean, we've already seen all that he's done, and now we're seeing him, you know, enter into basically politics and diplomacy. Um, seems like he was very talented at those things. Chieftains of the Ojibwe, Wyandots, Fox, Sauk, Odawas, Kickapoos, Lenape, Miami, Seneca, Onondaga, wow. and Delawares all joined his cause. Hey, as not of bad. course did the Shawnee. But Tecumseh was not all honeyed words. He imposed himself harshly, 
threatening death to any chiefs who collaborated with the Americans. Hmm. I mean, well, I mean, he is a warrior, and we've seen, and I mentioned earlier, his personal experience. It makes sense why he would be sort of hardened and willing to use violence. Um, you know, he has his mission. He's been through some pretty harrowing personal experiences, and he's willing to do what he needs to do to achieve his goals. Meanwhile, as more tribes joined Tecumseh's cause, more and more natives migrated into Prophetstown, which had evolved into the center of the native confederacy, a mm. swelling city-state that provided a powerful buffer against white settlers' westward expansion. Wow. The rapid growth of Tecumseh's confederacy, its active anti-colonial rhetoric, and its mm. existence within lands claimed by the United States put it on an inevitable collision course with the Americans. Oh yeah. The catalyst of this confrontation... I mean, it's on American land, or at least what Americans claim is their land, but even if it wasn't, you know, we've already talked about how the Americans feel it is their right to continue to expand West. There was always going to be an inevitable battle between these two sides. It was just going to happen. ...came in 1809, when Governor Harrison of Indiana coerced select chieftains of the Delaware, Potawatomi and Kickapoo to sign the Treaty of Fort Wayne, which ceded a 12,000 square kilometer piece of land along the Wabash River to the United States government. This treaty infuriated Tecumseh, as it flew right in the face of his core belief that land belonged collectively to all natives. He saw yeah. it as theft, a plain and simple attempt to extort weak chieftains whose land had been made poor by white settlers. In August of 1810, Tecumseh met with Harrison face to face outside oh, the wow. governor's colonial estate. Yeah, I did not know that they met face to face. Uh, they're basically going to be the main characters, the two respective leaders of each side in this upcoming conflict. Um, so this is, uh, this is pretty fascinating. And the two engaged in a heated parley. <laughs> Tecumseh insisted that native land could not be bought or sold, unless done so collectively by all the tribes acting as one, and mm. that the land ceded to the Americans in the recent treaties still rightfully belonged to the natives. And of course, William Henry Harrison is never ever going to accept this. <laughs> I mean, it is extraordinarily beneficial for the Americans that they're able to wheel and deal with the different Native American tribes. They can take advantage of that. The natives being disunited while, you know, America is this one big powerful country. Um, I mean, not on a global level, but compared to the native tribes, America is a big powerful country. And so they don't want the natives united and they're not going to accept any claims that land deals have to be um, united amongst the native tribes. They want to continue buying, selling, negotiating, and abusing individual tribes. Harrison replied that individual tribes were free to make treaties with the United States, but Tecumseh's confederacy was not recognized, nor did hmm. the local tribes welcome his interference in their affairs. The back-and-forth debate inspired a passionate reply from Tecumseh and his most iconic quote, oh. Sell a country? Why not sell the air, the great sea, as well as the earth? Did not the great spirit make them all for the use of his children? And now, to be fair, uh, I think that's more rhetoric. Tecumseh didn't actually behave as though the land belonged to everybody. We've already talked about how he basically wanted an independent state for the native people. But this is in many ways representative of sort of a broader Native American ideology of sort of more general or public ownership of the land, or just lack of ownership of the land, that, of course, the Europeans very much did not believe in, and this caused a lot of issues when the Europeans arrived in the Americas, and these two ideas of land ownership clashed with each other. Um, though, I think you could say about Tecumseh, you know, I think this is a little more idealistic than he actually behaved or actually was, but... You know, he's had to adapt to the circumstances within which he exists, right? Um, he's fighting for the survival of his people, and so he has to do what he has to do. Tensions soon grew between the two parties. Harrison was quick to point out that the Shawnee themselves had taken land from the Miamis, so what yeah. right had they to dictate the affairs of other tribes? 
If the tribes were all one nation, as Tecumseh claimed, why did the Great Spirit not have them all speak one language? Tecumseh lost... <laughs> I don't know about the second argument, but uh, Henry Harrison is correct that, yeah, Tecumseh has seized land himself, and that's what I was saying. Tecumseh is not as ideologically um, optimistic as that quote makes him out to be. He's far more of a realist, right? Um, but he is sort of using this traditional Native American argument, so I, I do think it makes sense. His temper, declaring that everything Harrison said was a lie and that the Americans had cheated the Native peoples. He brandished his tomahawk at the governor, prompting oh. Harrison to draw his saber and point it at Tecumseh. Oh, man. A tense standoff ensued, but neither side attacked. Harrison brought the meeting to an end and demanded Tecumseh and his followers leave. Tecumseh soon realized he had been wrong to threaten Harrison, and the two met once more the following day, this time at the Shawnee's camp. This time, Tecumseh opted for a more diplomatic route. He offered the United States alliance against Britain, but only if they would renounce their claim to native lands purchased in recent treaties. Hmm, interesting. So, as we're seeing, I mentioned earlier how the Native Americans didn't have some particular... Um, favor of the Brits. They only sided with the British because they thought uh, it would help them in that moment. We're seeing that here. Tecumseh is saying, look, we'll make an alliance with you to fight against the British uh, if you'll give us our independence. Now, I don't know how William Henry Harrison is going to respond, but I don't think the American government would ever accept that deal because, like I said, what they want most is to expand west. Sure, they also want to secure their territory against the British, and they want Britain to stop treating them like a colony, even though they're independent. But what America wants most is more land. They want to keep expanding. So, you know, this deal is just not going to happen. Harrison replied cordially, saying he would present Tecumseh's terms to the president, but did not expect the natives' conditions to be met. Yeah. No. To this, Tecumseh replied regretfully, I hope the great chief will give up this land. He is so far off, he may sit still and drink his wine, whilst you and I will have to fight it out. And, I mean, this is a point I've made several times in this video. For the United States, the United States government, you know, a lot of this was basically a frontier battle. Now, the War of 1812 would be far more important than just a frontier battle. Tecumseh would really, <laughs> you know be far more important than just a battle on the frontier of the United States, that's for sure. But all this conflict we've been seeing over the past couple of decades has been frontier fighting between American settlers, which hasn't been too important to the American government. It's been important, but it doesn't consume their lives like it does for the American settlers out west and the natives. For those groups, yeah, this is everything to them. This is their life. This is their land. This is their people. So Tecumseh is sort of highlighting that dissociation that Americans living along the coast and the American government have with what's going on out west. Harrison was impressed by the integrity of his enemy. He remarked that if it were not for the vicinity of the United States, he would perhaps hmm. be the founder of an empire. Uh, yeah, and I think William Henry Harrison might be right about that. We've seen that Tecumseh, he's a great warrior, he's very charismatic, he's good at diplomacy, he's a good leader, he's willing to do what it takes. So, seemingly a very impressive guy. In 1811, Tecumseh traveled southwards to present-day Alabama. The natives oh, wow. of that region were known to the Americans as the Five Civilized Tribes, due to their more... That's pretty far south, I didn't know Tecumseh uh, went down there. ...positive predisposition to adopting European practices. Tecumseh's goal was to extend his alliance along the entirety of the American frontier, wow. but he met fierce resistance in the south. The tribes there rejected his calls for unity more often mm. than not, instead preferring to abide by the treaties they had. Like I said, not every uh, native accepted Tecumseh's ideas. He had to do some convincing, some threatening, and we're seeing here a lot of resistance to his ideas, though, of course, the native tribes of the south um, have been and will be treated very, very badly. They have a really terrible fate in store for them, but they have a different way of doing things, and they're not just going to instantly side with Tecumseh. 
signed with the United States. This is exemplified in an exchange between Tecumseh and Pushmataha, a chieftain of the Choctaws. Pushmataha stood firm against Tecumseh, delivering a pithy statement. These white Americans give us fair exchange, their cloth, their guns, their tools, implements, and other things which the Choctaws need but do not make. It will be seen that the whites and Indians in this section are living on friendly oh, and man. mutually beneficial terms. I mean, look, they seems like they had a better relationship than uh, most instances <laughs> of the whites interacting with the natives, but unfortunately, if it was that ideal, and I seriously doubt that in the first place, it would not last. Uh, in the long term, you know, the white American settlers could just not abide living side by side with the Native Americans. It just wasn't going to happen. They either had to be massacred or pushed out west, and that's what's going to happen um, I mean, it's already been happening since the European colonists arrived, and it will continue to happen through the 1800s especially. Tecumseh delivered a vehement reply. Where today are the Pequot? Where are the Narragansett, the Mochican, the Poconet, yeah. and other powerful tribes of our people? They have vanished before the avarice and oppression of the white man. Sleep not longer, O Choctaws and Chickasaws. Will not the bones of our dead be ploughed up and their graves turned into ploughed fields? I think Tecumseh makes a good point. You know, he's saying, see the wider picture, man. <laughs> Maybe, you know, you may or may not have a good deal going with the Americans, but, you know, widen your horizons. Look at how our history has gone up until this point. Look at all these other tribes who have been pushed and destroyed. You know, do you really think that's not going to continue? You know, wake up, man. Unfortunately, his words fell on deaf ears, and mm. the Choctaws refused to join his cause. Nevertheless, Tecumseh did find limited success in the south. In September, he rode into the Muscogee town of Tukabachi. There he delivered another impassioned speech about the unity of natives and resistance against the white man. I wonder what would have happened if Tecumseh had gotten more support throughout the United States, you know, all along the frontier. Um, I don't know how much it would have changed the upcoming conflict, um, but it's a curious question to consider. Thousands of warriors raised their tomahawks and cheered, but one old chieftain remained silent. One story claims that Tecumseh stalked over to this chieftain and declared that he would march to Fort Detroit, stamp <laughs> his foot into the earth, and shake down every house in Tukabachi to prove that he had been chosen by the Great Spirit. Wow. Tecumseh then ventured back northwards, and sure enough, on December 16, 1811, the New Madrid earthquake rocked the southern United States, and every house in Tukabachi wow. was shaken to its foundations. How about that? We have, you know, we had the solar eclipse, now we have an earthquake, uh, natural disasters or natural, naturally occurring events being used as uh, sort of propaganda, religious propaganda. Um, I mean, very common throughout history, of course. Many interpreted this as the coming of Tecumseh's prophecy and proof they should join his confederacy. Henceforth, a significant amount of Muscogees declared themselves for Tecumseh, a faction which became known as the Red Sticks. All right, and we're going to end the video here. Uh, I mean, I know we're right in the middle of it, but it's already been roughly an hour. Um, we're about halfway through, and we're getting to the actual fighting. So this video was basically the background of uh, the American versus Native American fighting during the War of 1812. I really enjoyed this one. Uh, you know, I felt like I was able to give a lot of background knowledge, but I also learned some new stuff about Tecumseh. Um, and I also, like I mentioned at the beginning, I think this is an area of uh, American history that really needs to be looked at more, studied more, uh, it's a topic that should be remembered more. So that's one of the reasons I decided to do this one. Uh, I had a good time with this one. If you guys did as well, please leave a like, subscribe, check out the Patreon and channel memberships for exclusive reaction content. Anyway, I hope you guys are all having a good day today, and I will see you all again next time. Goodbye.